I want to now introduce uh, uh, the Honorable John Porter, who's really been a longtime champion of the NIH. When, uh, when one, uh, it, it used to be that uh, a high priority when uh, Mr. Porter was chair of the House Appropriations Subcommittee for Labor, Labor HHS, uh, I think one of his highest priorities must have been uh, the NIH and, uh, and the research that the nation was supporting because he spent hours hours with the directors. Uh, if sometimes I was scheduled to spend one hour with him, uh, it would go on, the session would go on for, uh, uh, for two hours. And I think that, that one, of the, one of the reasons behind that was he wanted others to know what we were doing and where we were going and what the hope was for the country. There is no better champion for, uh, for medical research than, um, uh, than John Porter. Uh, in addition to, uh, to his, uh, his being a former uh, congressperson, uh, Mr. Porter is now the president of um, the Research America, president, and uh, also the vice chair of the foundation for the NIH. Both activities clearly focused on improving the health of the nation. And uh, I think that, uh, that after spending 21 years in Congress as the, uh, as the, uh, uh, as the representative from uh, Northern Illinois, uh, many of us were sorry to see him step down because he was so effective in, uh, in, uh, in being yet another voice uh, for the NIH. But uh, although he's retired, he has, uh, as I say, uh, retired from the Congress, certainly not retired, retired, uh, he is a, continues to be an ardent supporter uh, and, uh, and chairing the Research America and vice chairing the foundation have been very, very important. He's also a member of the Institute of Medicine, so his involvement there is clear. He's a recipient of the Mary Wood Lasker Award for Public Service and has a, a building uh, at the NIH named for him as a testament to his commitment to biomedical research. Uh, the building is called Porter One, and uh, we are all so delighted that Porter Two is now really being built uh, with even the e even with the uh, relatively less robust increases that the NIH got, it was really an important priority to finish that building to make it into a Porter Neurosciences Center with Porter One finished and with Porter Two coming along. So, Porter Three now, John Porter, I introduce you to. Steve, uh, thank you for those kind introductory words. And I want all of you to know that despite his gruff exterior, inside his heart beats a heart of gold, and he cares deeply about the happiness and well-being of every single person. I'm honored to ask to join you uh, in the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the National Institute of Arthritis and Muscular Skele Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases. 25 years, that's a long time. That's before iPads, iPhones, Twitter or Facebook. Think of that. <laughs> Is it before telephones and fax machines? I, I'm not sure. 25 years ago, there was no pediatric rheumatology clinic at the Magnuson Clinical Center to diagnose, evaluate, and treat children with arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. And oh, there was no Hatfield building either. 25 years ago, the discovery of proteins that regulate bone growth and repair, paving the way for bone grafting and cartilage regeneration advances had yet to occur. Today, the millions of patients living with diseases such as arthritis, <clears throat> osteoporosis, 
lupus, inherited skin disorders, and other musculoskeletal diseases are grateful for these and all the advances in prevention and treatments that have transpired thanks to the exceptional work of NIAMS. All of us eagerly anticipate continued progress in the years ahead from this wonderful, wonderful institution. Steve and many of you know my wife, Amy, who led the foundation for the National Institutes of Health for eight years and now heads the National Osteoporosis Foundation as its CEO and executive director. So we are a family of friends of NIAMS and its leadership. Uh, are we? Well, in the words of one well-known Republican, you betcha. <laughs> as Steve mentioned, I was privileged to serve as chair of the Labor Age Subcommittee for six years and for 20 years on the subcommittee itself. I was so honored during that time to interact with and learn from numerous NIH scientists and many supported by NIH funding across the nation. I sat in on and then chaired countless hearings regarding appropriations for the director's office, for the ICs, for the centers and offices of NIH while I was in Congress. So for me, I feel so very fortunate to have had now 30 years of working with the leadership and people of NIH and NIAMS. What could possibly, possibly be better? As we celebrate the 25th anniversary of NIAMS, it's appropriate to remember those who brought its formation about. There were, of course, of course, many in the science and advocacy community whose names don't appear on the legislation, but whose vision and leadership brought NIAMS into being. In Congress, Senator Alan Cranston of California and Congressman Paul Rogers of Florida, my mentor at Hogan Lovells, where I actually work for a living, and for whom the plaza outside Building One is named, sponsored the original legislation leading to the National Arthritis uh, Act. And Steve, just uh, a week or two ago, received the Paul G. Rogers Award for Leadership in Science uh, by the uh, National Osteoporosis Foundation. Paul founded that uh, organization and chaired it for many years. But it was Congressman Henry Waxen, Waxman of California and the late Congressman Ed Madigan uh, of Illinois who co-sponsored the Health Research Extension Act of 1985, which formally established NIAMS. That was a Republican and a Democrat working together. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Dr. Larry Schulman served as its first director, as Francis uh, and Steve said. Steve's been around for a long time, but not that long. And uh, Larry successfully guided the development of the Institute through its formative years. <clears throat> of course, the many NIAM scientists and administrators past present and future, and NIAMS funded scientists deserve great credit in advancing the body of knowledge that continues to transform the methods with which to identify, treat, and someday cure diseases and disabilities that affect, as Steve said, practically every human being and family on Earth. Now about Steve. He served as NIAMS director since August of 1995. That was just about the time uh, that I became the chairman of the subcommittee. He was, this was in the old days when each IC director testified before the subcommittee, as Steve mentioned, and um, they testified about the progress that was being made with the funds that the taxpayers had entrusted to them. Also a time when subcommittee members were anxious to be educated about what was happening in medical research and all the fields under the subcommittee's jurisdiction. So we testified from then, at least until I retired in early 2001, we had uh, actual hearings where members came and listened to him. He also got the benefit of the doubling of funding for NIH and its institutes and centers. Good timing, Steve. Seriously, Steve is still a bench scientist, served our country in the military, uh, 
while he worked at Walter Reed, and to me, he personifies a scientist with a commitment to public service and more importantly, to the improvement of human health. All the people that work at NIH deserve the same accolades. All of you care deeply about human health and serve the public interest. So Steve, thank you for your tremendous leadership in your service to NIH and NIAMS and to medical research. You're a person who truly makes a difference in this world. So you arrived about the time of the doubling of funding for NIH, but of late, that is the last 10 years of your 16 years, forward momentum on the budget of NIAMS and all of NIH has generally been stalled. And now we find ourselves in the middle of an almost stagnant economy, overwhelming national debt, deficits as far as the eye can see, and the only thing on the table, and this is what I want to talk about principally, the only thing on the table for addressing this sad state of affairs is discretionary spending, the 12 percent of the federal budget that includes medical research. That's all that they have talked about up to this point publicly. Oh, and by the way, the doubling of funding for NIH occurred where we had surpluses as far as the eye could see. Those are long gone. So let's talk about where we are right now and what we must do to protect funding for this highest of national priorities. Labor H is the Democrats' favorite bill. In addition to medical research, it funds all of our education and labor programs and all of the HHS programs, which generally serve the most at-risk and vulnerable people in our society. The FY 2012 subcommittee allocation, that's the amount that the subcommittee has to spend on all 800 line items under its jurisdiction. The allocation under the budget resolution adopted by the House of Representatives for fiscal year 2012 is $139 billion, roughly a 12 percent cut from fiscal 2011 spending and 23 percent less than the President has recommended. It is interesting that the House Subcommittee Chair, Dennis Reberg of Montana, is in exactly the same position as I was as the new chairman of the subcommittee in 1995. Very interesting. I was given an allocation by the Republican uh, Budget Committee and the, and the Republican House uh, of 12 percent less than the previous year, exactly the same amount. And then that year, interestingly enough, NIH ended up with a 5.7 percent increase, increase. So it can be done if we all put our shoulder to it and make it happen. The Senate, controlled by the Democrats now, has adopted no budget resolution, and therefore there is no congressional budget resolution to be followed by both the House and the Senate. There's no agreement. The House is proceeding to mark up and pass its appropriation bills based solely on its budget resolution. Labor H is scheduled to be marked up by the subcommittee on July 26th. That's coming up not too long from now. So currently, there's no agreement about the amount of allocation for all discretionary spending, the total amount that will ultimately be spent on all departments, agencies, programs funded with discretionary or appropriated money of the federal government. This has to be worked out in negotiations on raising the debt limit, which are currently underway. Certainly, spending on labor age will exceed $139 billion as determined by the House alone. The Senate will see to the, to the fact that it's going to be somewhat higher. The question is how much. So there's three flashpoints. That's the FY 2011 spending that has already passed, and NIH experienced cuts of only $260 million when the House originally had suggested $1.6 billion in cuts for NIH. The second flashpoint is raising the debt limit ceiling, and the third will be resolving the differences between House spending bills and Senate spending bills. But let me repeat something, and I, I really want to get that into everybody's mind, and I've been saying this as often as I possibly can to anyone who will listen. 
downward pressure will continue on all of NIH and all discretionary appropriated as opposed to entitlement uh, funding unless the Congress comes to grips with where the real money lies. That's in entitlements and tax expenditures. And you can read tax expenditures as special interest provisions in our tax code that benefit so many narrow interests and not necessarily the American people as a whole. So all of us must urge our members and senators to say what their priorities will, what of their priorities they will put on the table. The 30-year game of I'm for balancing the budget on the other guy's priorities has to end, and we must make certain that it does end. The system left to us by our founders absolutely requires policymakers with distinctly different views to find common ground. That's the only way we can operate in America. In the end, after perhaps some very perilous days, they will find a framework for working out a long-term plan. But meanwhile, cuts in fiscal year 2012 discretionary could be very real and very painful. The President and many on both sides of the aisle have been saying the right things. What can all of us do now to push them to do the right things? I give my views all the time to voluntary health organizations and friends of the individual institutes as I did to the NIAMS coalition in the fall of 2009 on targeting, messaging, strategies, and tactics for impacting decisions made on the Hill regarding medical research. But what can NIH itself do to help in this process? You certainly can't lobby, and Francis and his predecessors have been very careful not to cross that line as they should. But I have a suggestion. I know Francis and Steve and all the IC directors are anxious to get members of Congress out to NIH to see not only how the taxpayers' money is spent, but the tremendous progress that is being made in biomedical research. And I've said to Francis and to Elias and to Harold for a long time now that if we can just get a member to come out to campus and see NIH and see what you do, that member will be inspired and become an advocate for medical research. I've seen it over and over and over again. I haven't checked this with uh, Francis or with Pat White. I don't think Pat is here. But it seems to me that an organized program that will invite not just the members of the subcommittee, not just the leadership, every single member of Congress, maybe one or two at a time, no more, to come out here to the campus, and this will be a long-term ongoing program from now on, would do a great deal of good. You would have to offer to pick them up. These are busy people. You'd have to offer to pick them up on the hill, get them quickly through security. That's a, that's a task. <laughs> and have structured, relatively brief initiative that you present to them in a laboratory and get them back to, hill, to the hill in a very short time. You would have to have some focused literature that they could read on the way and possibly be able to find a disease that affects that member's family so as to make the presentation as pointed as possible. That would involve probably every single institute at NIH on an ongoing basis. You would have to suggest a time that might work for their schedule and offer to show their health staff person the same presentation if the member couldn't come, or better yet, to get them to come together and offer the presentation to both of them. In other words, a very concerted effort to get every member and their appropriate staff out to the campus to see, and I think that will make a huge difference in their understanding of medical research and your, the difference you make for the health of every human being. The invitation itself, even if not acted on the member, and I say this all the time, giving an invitation is important in and of itself because then they know that they're wanted. They know that you are open to them. They know that you are not hiding anything that they need to know. I would keep close track of their reactions, follow up the invitations, and make certain uh, that they uh, 
uh, get here. Uh, then I would get a hold of an NIH-funded scientist in their state or district and have them in, be invited for sure to the research institution where they can go at home. In other words, this has got to be a, a structured program, ongoing basis, every single member of Congress, and get them into the laboratories and see what is done. I think it could go a long way to making a difference in placing medical research at a high national priority. It could also include data on grants received by investigators in their state or district, projections of economic impact, and jobs created. That is very important today with the economy the way it is. It would be something you would have to work on constantly, and as Pat White knows, uh, their availability is usually only in the middle three days of the week, and it always is fraught, fraught with the possibility that they could have votes. You'd have to plan this very carefully, and the timing would have to be right. I realize that you work on this a great deal, but I think a broader, longer-term, continuous program to reach each member of Congress, and they turn over more than you think, to get to each member of Congress can make all the difference. Again, the invitation itself is certainly a direct me message to them that you are open and anxious to have them come see what you do. So that's my sermonette to the leaders of NIAMS and NIH. With a desire to be helpful uh, to doing everything possible to put medical research at the highest of national priorities and secure for NIH the resources on a sustained basis that are necessary for taking advantage of the great scientific opportunities that are now available that both Steve and Francis uh, spoke of. NIAMS, as I mentioned, is a special institution to our family one that deserves all the accolades that have come and will come this day, day your way. All of you under Steve's leadership do wonderful work to improve human health and make people everywhere happier, healthier, and longer lived. All of us stand in awe of your work, and we salute you. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks very much, John. Let me uh, just tell you that uh, we are going to summarize that sermonette, and we're going to send it along to um, to uh, uh, Building One, Pat White, and Francis. I think it's a uh, it's an important message to uh, uh, iterate and reiterate uh, all the time, and actually to act on. And for those of you who are in the audience, you should know that uh, the coalition uh, of uh, NIMS. Uh, has actually organized such meetings where we have brought out, where they have brought out uh, 10 or 12 or 14 staffers, not the Congress people, but the staffers uh, who actually uh, do a lot of the writing of the legislation and do a lot of the understanding. And, uh, and we have educated those staffers uh, in that way. We ourselves can't invite them, but certainly uh, I think the last round, uh, Annie, I think you were involved in that, uh, was uh, was and Sheila was involved in that were, was uh, really a terrific uh, uh, it was eye opening for the staffers to know what we do here. Some people think that the thirty one billion dollars is all spent in Bethesda and it's a revelation to them that uh, most of the money is spent uh, elsewhere eighty eighty five percent of the money is spent elsewhere.